the reason we have all these cameras running is so that we will be able to share this information on our website. In fact, I'm glad you asked that question because these are just a few of the resource pages on my website. There's a wealth of information that, for example, if you're interested in pesticide addiction, there's a very well documented resource on pesticides. Uh, all kinds of things that you can go and get the information right now from my website. My goal is to leave something for posterity that will last through time and help the next generation be a whole lot better than I was when I started. Another one? Come on, I didn't intimidate everybody. <laughs> uh, so earlier you, you asked a question, you said, why are bats important in restoring biodiversity? So I was just um, hoping that I could fill in some more notes. Oh, good. That's a great question. First of all, let me just point out that if you just look at cave ecosystems, bats provide the predominant energy that fuels whole cave ecosystems. Uh, a study done years ago by Bernie Steele from Auburn University in Bracken Cave showed that a single tablespoonful of bat guano in Bracken Cave can contain a thousand bacteria species and hundreds of gen genera. Now, you might say, oh, now we got proof that bats are dangerous. You know, what we don't seem to ever figure out is that, for example, these virus hunters these days we're all out there trying to scare us about the dangerous viruses they're finding, potentially dangerous viruses they're finding in bats. We have more viruses in our bodies than we have cells. Most viruses are obviously benign and may in fact be essential to our very survival. The same is probably true of bacteria. The bacteria from Bracken, instead of looking at them in shock and saying, oh my God, it must be a dangerous place, Let's look at them from the positive side that Bernie Steele looked at them. He found bacteria that can de deactivate ammonia waste products from industry. He found bacteria that produce chitinase that can break down the chitin from seafood waste byproducts and turn it into gasohol. He found bacteria that had uh, that were actually used by corporations to improve detergents. And um, just that one cave had a treasure trove of potential biodiversity depending on, that depended on bats. Now, quite aside from that, bats are essential to whole ecosystems from deserts to rainforests. Uh, Remember those pictures I showed you of bats, pollinating agaves, and cacti? Hundreds of species from the U.S. all the way to Chile. And those are major niche-making plants that if you want to promote biodiversity, or if you want to harm biodiversity, just take something that's important, all those kinds of essential plants out of the system. And I wish I'd had time to tell you more about the pollination side too because it's incredibly interesting. For my last geographic article, I was sent to the Andes of Ecuador to photograph some bat pollinated plants. And when I got there, I found something really incredible. I wish I'd been, had time to show you tonight. The Puya plants take a hundred years to reach maturity. A hundred years, they flower once and die. You think pollination is important? <laughs> Very. Okay, where do they live? Above Timberline in the Andes, where it's so cold bats can't live up there. So, how do they get pollinated? Nobody has yet solved this, but I'm betting on the solution. Just like the Andean condor, in the evening, these bats are riding thermals up the Andes just like escalators in a shopping center. They're riding those thermals up, going up for a quick sip of nectar up high above timberline, coasting back down to the low valleys where they rear their young. Uh, 
We know the bats are up there pollinating the flowers. That, there's no question. We're just not sure who's carrying them up. It's probably the thermals that they're riding. Another question? Yeah. Uh, I saw a special a while ago about vampire bats because they do altruistic behavior. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they, they exhibit altruism actually very similar to what humans exhibit. Uh, most of us aren't truly, truly unselfishly altruistic. We're more likely to help those who have helped us or, or would most likely help us in the future if not in the past. And vampire bats have very good memories. In fact, that gets me off track a little bit. I gotta just for a second remind you about how intelligent bats are and how good their memories are. Vampires remember who did them favors, who fed them when they were hungry, who helped them in the past, and they return, they're much more likely to return favors in the future for those who've helped them in the past. Now back to one of my favorite bats, the froggy and bat trachops. <clears throat> we found that we could train these in just a few minutes. Uh, I'll say, I think now I could train them in 30 minutes, it used to take me two hours. Um, train them to come to our hand on call. Do you know that those bats, when they were marked and released back to the wild, remembered to come on call to a person's hand years later when recaptured? And there's a recent study out showing that two different species of myotis bats were trained to do things that, <clears throat> well, one of them was trained to do things that bats just don't ever learn to do on their own. It was shown that the bats just couldn't master the, the knowledge without somebody teaching them. Then they allowed the trained bats to associate with another species that hadn't been trained, and the species that hadn't been trained suddenly learned the, learned the trick from the trained bats of a different species. Bats are just incredible. I wish I had the memory. I wish I could learn as fast as the bats. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. It's taken me 40 years to figure out things that I look back and wonder why I didn't figure them out in the first year. We're talking about bats whose bodies are about that big that you saw tonight were training me. Who would have ever believed that possible? We're discovering such amazing things about bats and I'm sure that there are going to be a whole lot more discovered about vampire bats. Uh, vampire bats are really special in that they, they have a treasure trove of molecules in their saliva that, that um, have been reported to uh, be of great potential value to modern medicine. Uh, they have social order that's probably a level above most other mammals. We would love vampires if we just didn't hate them so much. <laughs> okay, enough about vampires. Anybody else? They're right here. Um, I've seen videos of conservationists. Excuse me, I'm not the best to hear. Oh, okay. Um, I've seen videos of bats that seem to be affectionate. Do bats ever display affection? Like, oh, do bats ever d display affection? Yes. <clears throat> Um, some of the first knowledge I had of that kind of thing, uh, Sarah Steves here could probably tell you from her personal experience, she lives in Australia and deals with flying foxes. She's here visiting briefly. <clears throat> um, I remember years ago a woman named June Took. I published a story about her in one of my first issues of Bats Magazine. Uh, she hand reared a, an or, a orphan flying fox, gradually released it back to the wild, and in the fall it migrated with the other bats and left for the winter. Next spring it came back, and one evening, to her great surprise, she's out in her backyard and here this four foot wingspan bat comes flying down out of the sky, lands on her shoulder, and is licking her and squealing in delight uh, to see her again. Well, this went on for a few weeks, and then she realized that this bat was pregnant. 
Flying foxes, when they give birth to their pups, oftentimes carry them off to a different place and leave them at night so that the pythons or other predators that haunt the roost don't get them. This mother bat would bring her pup to the woman who hand reared her to babysit at night while she went out to feed. <laughs> and I know of another story, uh, a lady that lived by a national park in Sydney, and she had a flying fox that a friend raised, an orphaned one, and it developed rickets because it didn't have, they didn't know in those days exactly the nutrition it needed. And it, so it couldn't really fly and couldn't be released back to the wild, but the lady couldn't keep the bat anymore, so she brought it to her friend, and her friend let it live in her backyard and would feed it in the backyard, a free-ranging flying fox. Once a year, the woman who originally reared the bat would come back at Christmas time and bring it chocolates. And there is nothing that an Australian flying fox loves more than chocolate. <laughs> and year after year, Helen reported that when this gal came to her front door, as soon as she opened the door and spoke to the woman and the woman's voice could be heard, the flying fox in the backyard starts screaming, trying to get to her, excited to see her. And there are even instances I've heard of where flying foxes remembered their initial benefactors by voice after not having seen them for 10 years. And none of that really surprises me given that tray cops, having been trained to come on call to a hand, still can remember to do that years later when recaptured from the wild. Okay, yeah. Would you, or would bats be classified as keystone species given all of the... I'm sorry, I'm not working here again. Would um, bats be considered as a keystone species since they kind of play a major role in pollinating and insect control and everything like that? Would bats be considered a keystone species because of their important roles? Uh, many bats, as far as that can be taken, would be considered keystone species. There's no question that uh, whole ecosystems can be seriously threatened by the demise of bats that service those systems. I saw some other hands. Don't give up. In this modern age, it seems like scientists were losing, I'm just like, I mean, truth doesn't seem to be popular anymore that they, people, Think they have more truth that they don't listen to scientists for just like see climate change or many other things. They prefer to listen what they want to hear instead of just listening to what you will tell the students. I'm glad you brought that up. I have what might be a slightly unpopular opinion to be voicing here, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I believe a lot of this can be laid at the feet of scientists themselves. We too often have done esoteric things that made no difference, just satisfied our curiosity and we didn't even communicate it well to the public when we did it. So eventually people start losing interest in what we do and faith in its value. And so we become more and more dependent instead of on government grants for research, we become more dependent on private grants from industries that usually have a private motivation behind what they give us and they expect us to find that uh, cigarettes are good for you and, you know, and, and, and it seems like there's always a scientist around somewhere who's willing to find what they want found. And as long as scientists are desperate for funds because they didn't communicate well with the public and, and do really worthwhile things, they're going to be vulnerable to having to take what I'd call bad money and come to bad conclusions that leads to distrust of science. And there have been a whole series of papers, you can find them quickly uh, in the last several years about how prevalent bad science is these days, people uh, trying to prove instead of test hypotheses. And uh, so we have brought that as scientists kind of on ourselves. And it's time that we, you know, just 
as recently as last June, there was a paper in Nature by leading uh, epidemiologists decrying this big scaremongering about the need to hunt for rare viruses as an inappropriate waste of the public money. And they actually said in that paper in Nature that this was going to come back to haunt scientists ruin, wrecking havoc with their reputation and credibility just at a time when science is most needed. We can't afford to keep getting bought off because we didn't do science the way we should have to begin with to develop credibility. I agree 100%. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What kind of camera do I use? That's a neat question. First of all, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Several years ago, I was at a, an international research conference, and uh, a guy got up and made a presentation. It was really cool. He really had every little detail of his research well documented photographically. And um, so when he finished, <clears throat> I got him aside and said, you know, I'm really curious. That was one of the best presentations I've heard in years. Yeah, it's so well documented photographically. Uh, I never seem to be able to document my stuff that well because it's just too much hassle carrying all that heavy equipment around. And uh, <clears throat> he smiled. He said, here's my secret. He pulled out a little pocket point and shoot camera Pentax, Optio Pentax, which at that time wasn't even probably a tenth as good as your average cell phone is today. And he just pointed out that having a camera was better than having no camera. <laughs> and it's amazing what you could do. I, I am amazed. There's a book coming out that you should probably know about. It's called Bats, A Guide to All Species. It's coming out through the Smithsonian uh, in April, early April. I'm the science editor and photographer for the book. One of my pictures in that book was taken with a point and shoot camera. I mean, with a with a cell phone, with not even a, that good a cell phone. Um, it's better to have a, a a reasonable cell phone picture than no picture. People think they have to have a lot of expensive equipment to take good pictures. Mostly you need to know what it takes to compose and find the right lighting and do it right. Uh, with modern cell phones, you can take all kinds of beautiful pictures with nothing more than a headlight. It's amazing what you can do. And there are books that you can probably buy for $5. I know Kodak used to produce little booklets on how to, how to compose your picture, how to get the lighting right. It is simple to learn good photography, and there is nothing that will pay you bigger dividends than being able to show people exactly what you do and why it's important. And to answer that question, I still haven't answered. <laughs> I now use a, a, a Sony. Uh, Teresa, what is it? It's a Sony A7R3. A7R3. <laughs> See, I don't even keep up with the cameras anymore. They change so fast. For a long time, I used Canons. But um, it's not necessary to have a big, fancy camera. People don't expect you to stop the motion perfectly. Like, I'll bet I could have taken a cell phone picture of a bat coming into a pitcher plant and had people ooh and awe over it. Sure, the wings would have been blurred a little bit. It would have just given a different artsy effect. <laughs> you don't have to have a lot of money and expensive gear to do good photography. We have no excuse if we don't learn to communicate. And I hear people all the time say, well, it terrifies them to speak in public. There's no excuse for being terrified about speaking in public either. There's not a kid around who wouldn't like you to tell him a story. Practice on him. <laughs> when you go to a party and you see a friend, 
who's really good at entertaining everybody with his or her stories. Watch how they do it. You can do it too. It's just a matter of paying attention. Things you do, I mean, if you're doing research that has no interest, quit. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's two. I'll take the one in back first, and then you next. If you're uh, presenting to the public and you have someone ask you, like if they have bats on their property, what can I do for those bats, or how can I prevent things like white nose syndrome from spreading? What would you tell them? Uh, first of all, don't even spend any time worrying about white nose syndrome spreading. I know that's not going to be a popular statement. First of all, white nose syndrome is going to spread everywhere it can spread. It's not stoppable. The good news is that just as probably happened many years earlier in Asia and in Europe, there are resistant individuals that are gradually surviving and beginning to rebuild populations. If you look in the northeastern United States where it hit 10 years ago, I know of single colonies there that were 500 bats in them before white nose syndrome and that are now 500 again post white nose syndrome and we're talking about one of the two species hardest hit. Uh, there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's White nose syndrome is, I, I just published a new resource on climate, climate change in bats. Read that resource. Um, in there I talk about white nose syndrome in the U.S. versus heat stroke of killing thousands of bats in Australia. I don't know if you've heard recently, but Sarah could certainly tell you. Uh, where she lives in Keynes, Australia, uh, tens of thousands of flying foxes have died in, in just a few days' time from heat stroke. And those problems are very similar to our problems of white nose syndrome, even though they're dramatically different. What they are is they're the result of accumulated stress that we have ignored for decades. For over a hundred years, flying foxes in Australia have been losing their giant old ancient uh, trees that were sometimes two, three hundred feet tall along river systems, and they could move up and down in those trees over the rivers and find exactly the temperature they wanted by just getting into more or less sun. Now in my resource I just published, take a look and I show a huge ancient gum tree and then you see the regrowth around it, they look like matchsticks almost. And these bats have lost their choice places to roost. They've had to move into urban environments to find roosts at all. And so today, when a heat wave comes along, they are just set up, ready to die in mass, because they're already, they've moved to an urban environment where it's probably four or five degrees hotter than it was where they naturally should have been roosting. They've lost the diversity of roost type that they had. And now, where does that translate to being analogous to white nose syndrome? Our bats in America, have gradually lost their original roosting habitat. And for example, <clears throat> uh, if you go to my resource on, uh, let's see here, Finding, Protecting, Restoring America's Historic Bat Caves, go to that one, <clears throat> and you'll find my story about Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave, Kentucky is the largest cave known anywhere in the world, about 400 miles of passages huge volume, multiple entrances at different levels. It used to trap a wide range of warm and cold air, provide very stable climate for bats. And if you had an extraordinary heat wave or cold spell, the bats could just move up or down the wall to get the temperature they wanted. They were okay. That one cave conservatively harbored more than 10 million hibernating bats each winter probably tens of millions. There was a newspaper, the way this first came to our attention, there was a newspaper article that was published in the 1860s, I believe, 
and it said that miles of the passages were covered solidly by great masses of bats every winter. Well, we all know you can't trust the news media for that kind of information. But it caused the Park Service to start, you know, wondering. They had never seen large numbers of bats in the time they had owned the cave, but they started wondering. And they asked me and a group of experts to come check. We spent a day checking and in one day found evidence of more than 10 million hibernating bats. No question, the paleontological evidence of the skulls and bones, the stained limestone where they roosted, uh, and we got to checking and found that a professor from, I can't remember now, if it was one of the big name Eastern schools, had gone down to check and see if there were really all these millions of bats that were claimed to be in Mammoth Cave. And he wrote up and published a report on it. I think he was from Princeton. And in his report, he said, and I saved voucher specimens that I sent to the Smithsonian. So I went to the Smithsonian to see the voucher specimens. Guess what they are? Endangered gray and Indiana bats. Uh, two species that were probably among the most abundant mammals that ever lived in eastern North America, both on the endangered list. Uh, losing sites like that have just proven devastating in the stress levels for bats. The bats lost these secure bastions of survival. Now when you get something like a, an extra fungus comes along to stress them or a heat wave or something else, they're far more susceptible than they probably would have been if we had been paying attention sooner. So if you want to save bats, and help them recover from white-nose syndrome, instead of trying to find a cure, which we cannot do, it won't work, instead of trying to find a cure, find these places where they once lived in great security and help restore some of those so that they can return and rebuild. And I have done that actively in my career and can t tell you that it works. At Mammoth Cave National Park, there was one section of the cave that we found that used to house at least hundreds of thousands of hibernating bats. I appealed to the Park Service to, un they had concrete over that cave entrance. I appealed to them to take the concrete out and put a bat friendly gate in. And it took something like five years of appeals before they finally allowed us to remove the concrete and put a bat gate in. And they even went so far as to claim that they had engineers check and that if they removed the concrete, the cave would collapse. The concrete was holding the cave up. Well, just the other day, a colleague of mine showed me some really spectacular footage of swarming endangered Indiana bats at a cave gate. And uh, I said, I'm curious, where is that? Turned out to be the site that we got restored at Mammoth Cave. There's Hubbard's Cave, if you read in that fine, protecting, restoring historic bat caves. I got that one protected more than 20 years ago. The bats would have now been completely extirpated there, but after protecting them and restoring, we now have reclaimed over 400,000. We know it can be done. We know how to do it. We've just got to enough of us care enough and educate enough other people to care enough that politicians and other decision makers start paying attention. It's as simple as that. You mentioned in the presentation that we as researchers we should conduct good uh, good science to help people. But how would how would you conserve a species that may not be that interesting or beneficial to the human population? Okay, the question was, how do you conserve a species that may not be all that exciting or beneficial? Uh, <clears throat> now you're asking me to come up with the ultimate unpopular answer. <clears throat> One of the first papers that I enjoyed reading way back when I was starting my conservation career, it was published, I believe it was in Time or Newsweek, and it was titled, Why Don't We Pull the Plug on the Condor and Ferret? And it basically said, why are we spending millions of dollars trying to save basket cases that could no longer make it in the wild while we're ignoring 
species that make a very big difference, and they actually named my gray bats as the example of the ones that would make a difference. And in fact, the gray bat, for a tiny fraction of what's been spent on condors, has, in 1969, that species was in such dire shape that it was predicted that it would soon become extinct. And uh, as a result of conservation actions, carefully taken, we now have millions more gray bats than when their extinction was predicted. Done at a tiny fraction of the cost that is taken to save condors that still can't survive on their own in the wild. We have to feed them to keep them alive in the wild. These are like zoo birds in the wild. Uh, I hear all the time about, you know, it's popular in terms of raising money to sell you on the idea of you've got a chance, you know, if you just give us another thousand dollars or something, we can save this rare animal, the final ten of them from extinction, and you'll have done it. It appeals to people. But truthfully, I would be interested in saving the last ten of a species that had a track record of once having been a key role player in the environment. I'd put a high priority on that as long as it really was feasible to do something to recover it. Sometimes it's not. Um, but you know, in the modern world, we're gonna have to start setting some serious priorities. And just as if you, if you were investing in the stock market, let's say somebody just died and left you a billion dollars worth of investments in the stock market, you wouldn't just start selling those off willy-nilly tomorrow. You'd try to figure out which ones were gonna be worth something in the future and which ones weren't. And we have harmed nature to the point these days where we're going to have some very tough decisions that we're going to have to make and we're going to have to live with them. And some of those decisions are going to have to be, instead of spending millions trying to save a species that is almost certain to go extinct anyway, let's spend a few thousand to keep one from going on the endangered list. I can't tell you how frustrated I have found it almost my whole career, especially when I started conserving bats. I'd go to a foundation for funds to help bats. They'd say, is it endangered? We only, we only help endangered species. Well, it's not endangered yet, but if it becomes endangered, it's gonna seriously threaten a whole ecosystem. I mean, Species like, for instance, free-tailed bats here in Texas knock out bracken cave, and it's like knocking out the trout hatchery for a whole wide area. And um, we just can't afford to let these simple things happen just because the species isn't officially endangered yet. I am much more interested personally in preventing the endangerment of key ecological role players that I am in trying to bring one back from the edge that was always, I mean, many of these endangered species that we hear so much about protecting live on islands as just, they're, they're, they never were common, they're, they're always rare to begin with, and uh, then we're asked to spend a huge amount of money saving them, when saving them won't make hardly any difference to other species in the planet. We're going to have to start paying more attention to where we can do the most good and the choices are not going to be nice, but that's the world we've created and we're going to have to live that way. Or would you say the ecosystem or the species at level of approach of conservation is more important? I would probably, you know, there's always a trick in everything, uh, but I'd probably say the ecosystem. Uh, I, as an ecologist, I have to be much more concerned about ecosystem health than species health. Uh, the ecosystem, once it goes, you're going to lose probably thousands of species. You've got to protect the ecosystem that supports all those species. And uh, just, just trying to piecemeal spend large amounts of money saving individual species if they don't contribute to the good of the whole, uh, I'd be careful how much I want to invest. <laughs>
as a follow up to that, are, is there a good way to get the public or to care about the ecosystem as a whole? A lot of times it's easier to get them to care for a singular species, which is why we end up funding so much to save an endangered species, but not really protect the habitat or the ecosystem itself. Well, here would be, <clears throat> here would be my approach. <clears throat> Go to Southeast Asia, for example, and on a single trip, I visited more than 10 caves in one country that had formerly had tens to hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of bats in them that were totally extirpated by people just eating too many. Restoring those bats <clears throat> can be of huge ecological and economic value, as I demonstrated at Khao Chon Pond Cave, which was the only one on that trip where I had the power to say, okay, you own this cave, hire a game warden to protect it. But if you, if you don't <clears throat> pay attention to saving places like that, you're dooming the whole system eventually. And uh, I find it so much more practical for example, I can go to a place like Khao Chong Prawn and say, okay, hire a game warden, do this, and actually have measurable results within a measurable amount of time. Time, and again, I could give you more than a dozen cases of reestablishing hundreds of thousands of bats from a single, simple, inexpensive conservation action. When that happens, <clears throat> get in there and document the impact of the bats. That's where we need real science. Show how people benefited by taking that first step. That's why I'm so disappointed that recently the funding was turned down to a group of scientists that wanted to document the economics at Khao Chong Prawn and how valuable those bats were. If we could just document conclusively the value of those bats, there would be communities all over clamoring to save their bats. I, Paul and I were in Phnom Penh, Cambodia a couple of years ago in a town not far out of Phnom Penh. There was a bat cave that during the time of the Khmer Rouge, they hadn't protected those bats and the bats had pretty much all been eaten and there were very few left, but when the Khmer Rouge left, the local people remembered how valuable the bat guano used to be for fertilizer, and the local village chief set up 24 hour a day protection of the cave. The bats started to rebuild population by the time we reached the area. The guano sales had reached $50,000 a year already. Uh, in the Mekong Delta, we visited areas I could show you pictures where we showed that people were taking and cutting palm fronds, drying them in the sun, wiring them together in bundles of like five or six in a bundle, hoisting them back up into palm trees up 40, 50 feet above ground, tying 10 of these around a palm tree trunk so it made a big skirt. And these are artificial bat houses that the people on their own without any outside scientists telling them it was a good idea had figured out to do. How did I know about it? Because a famous war correspondent from the Vietnam era had seen these and wrote me a letter saying, someday you ought to take a look at this, it's pretty interesting. Well, those people didn't even know that the bats were eating crop pests, they just knew that the fertilizer was valuable. But if you can start with just little things like that, showing them how to expand artificial roofs, how to restore a bat cave. And once they do that, and you can document the good that came from that, then you can say, hey, you know, you could probably expand even more bats if you just protect some natural habitat over here and over here and over here. You know, even fence rows between crops can make a difference. And so you get that first nucleus of bats in a cave or an artificial roost, and oftentimes there's going to be a limit to how far they can expand because you've got monoculture beyond and there's nothing for them to eat. 
but it gives you a foothold for saying, okay, now we're going to start building our populations back and you get the uh, development of biodiversity. I showed you the Mediterranean site where they wouldn't have been successful had it not been for the natural forest a mile or so away. Um, that's all, I think, a wonderful opportunity to start with bats because bats, you can get measurable, visible results that people can understand and then you can start moving outward into other things that are less understandable for them. So I think bats make a wonderful first model for starting to restore biodiversity. Did I set a record for length of an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else brave enough to ask a question? What's your favorite bat? What's my favorite bat? <laughs> uh, actually, I don't have a favorite bat. It tends to be the kind I worked with most recently, I guess. But, um, you know, I would have said years ago that my favorite bats were the large carnivores because I thought they were exceptionally brilliantly smart. But... Um, you know, since then I found out that these little tiny woolly bats are smarter than I ever dreamed the carnivores could be. In fact, I remember Jack Bradbury used to be a really big time up and coming bat scientist many years ago. And he was going to study the big uh, carnivorous bat vampirum spectrum and perform uh, experiments on their intelligence. A year after he announced that he was going to do that, I met him somewhere and I said, Jack, how did your experiments with vampirum come? He said, oh, it was terrible. The bat was much smarter than I was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, truthfully, uh, within a single species of bat, I find huge range of personality and intelligence and and in the study where one species trained another species, they actually found that some were far faster learners than others. Some could learn in almost minutes and some in hours and some didn't. <laughs> and uh, in fact, that's one of the secrets to my success in taking pictures of bats. I'll, if at all possible, and especially if I know it's going to be a hard species to photograph, I'll catch half a dozen of them and test them quickly. I have little things I can do to test them and see what their personalities are. And uh, sometimes for a shot, I actually want a dumb bat. <laughs> and sometimes I want a really smart bat and I'll pick them that way. And there are ways of figuring it out just like with people. <laughs> and, and just like with people, You'll have your favorites and ones that aren't so favorites. <laughs> Favorite adventure story? Wow. Favorite adventure stories. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, uh, there was a time that I got caught by communist terrorists while I was out with Charlie Handley, my mentor. <laughs> uh, he had given me my first big time employment after college and sent me off on an expedition to lead an expedition in Venezuela and we'd gotten there ahead of most of our equipment we were working way up high in the mountains above Caracas and uh, Charlie came down to visit and I wanted to really impress him showing him some really cool bats and so I I borrowed a Jeep now this brings up a whole other area that we didn't talk about tonight. One of the keys to success in life is learning to win friends instead of battles. At that time in Venezuela, as, as I got there to lead my first big project for the Smithsonian, 65 police a year were being shot and killed on the streets of Caracas by communist insurgents. There were 50 caliber tank battles going on at the university. I mean, it was not a safe place to be. You couldn't go into a bank without going by machine gun emplacements and sandbags out in front. 
Well, amidst all that, my group had an in with the president of the country, and so we were given a place to stay way up in the mountains in a really perfect kind of a hangout for the old dictator who had been ousted. And uh, it turned out that the guy that was managing this place was head of the local Communist Party. And um, I found out who he was, but, you know, I have never shunned somebody because of their isms. And we used to just tease each other after we got to know each other. He'd call me his uh, amigo commie. <laughs> I mean, his amigo Yankee, and I'd call him uh, my me amigo commie. And uh, so when Charlie Handley came down to visit, I asked this guy if I could borrow his Jeep so I could show Handley some really cool places for bats. So here we are driving the Communist Party leader's Jeep when we get caught by the Communists. <laughs> and uh, believe me, it was one wild chase when they caught us. We were up on a really rugged road with 200 foot cliffs off the side, no rails ring to keep you from sliding off the road. Wild chase, they caught us. But after they caught us, fortunately, instead of shooting us right off, they figured out that we were in the Communist Party boss's Jeep. And so they radioed him, and you never saw a guy have more fun than when he came driving back in his Jeep. And he said, ah, see, sí, Paga Bueno to near Amigos Commies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just one. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of stories. You can buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of those stories in, in my book, The Secret Lives of Bats, which uh, a couple of my young lady staff would be well, ha very happy to sell you tonight, and I'd be happy to s sign your copy if you're interested. Well, let's give a big hand to Dr. Tuttle and Mary. <laughs>